Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Namo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Namo Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Namo Tassa Aparuta de Sangamata Sataura, ye soda one tab, Amunjan to Sadang. So, after that very nice invitation, <laughs> chorus. These are the, the formalities that we use. Uh, they, they give a kind of dignity to, to life, ceremonies and customs. Uh, we can see that if we just follow what's the easiest thing to do, and sometimes we drift into kind of just a, a kind of sloppy, uh, take the easy way out attitude. Uh, so I found especially living life as a Buddhist monk, very helpful in kind of reflecting a, a kind of quality in myself that doesn't want to be bothered with, uh, with the things that seem to take time or kind of get in the way. Uh, so kind of, what's the, kind of take the easy way out. Uh, don't complicate life. Just do what you feel like. Uh, kind of mind that I have uh, was reflected very much in, in learning to uh, they conform and surrender into a, a traditional form um, monastic etiquette we have a whole kind of system of etiquette that we relate to each other in, in sometimes quite formal ways but in Etiquette also has its value in the sense that it gets us through a, a lot of difficult things in, in, a, in a polite and uh, graceful way that, that we wouldn't be able to do if we were just following the, the mood we're in or the, or the easiest, uh, most convenient way to do something. So living in a tradition... Uh, traditional form. This uh, Thai first Buddhism is very conservative. It's uh, uh, it's uh, probably the most con- one of the most conservative uh, forms of Buddhism. So uh, it's um, in the northeast of Thailand, where where I lived. Uh, the people are are very conservative. They're not like kind of Bangkok Thais or People that have, say, more kind of exposed to Western ways or more sophisticated. Northeast Thailand used to be, say, 30 years ago, the most kind of backward part of Thailand. Uh, it was uh, by the Thais uh, that lived in Bangkok or Central Thailand, they considered the Siberia of Thailand. <laughs> There's a place you didn't want to go. Uh, it's not particularly beautiful. It's not like Northern Thailand or Southern Thailand or the, the provinces on the Gulf of Thailand that have a lot of beauty. Uh, the Isan or the Northeast Thailand is a flat plain, rather boring. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't have much uh, kind of majestic mountain, it doesn't have beaches, it doesn't have a kind of grandeur that other parts of Thailand have. The people are were, uh, very poor and uh, life was much more, there's much more hardship in the Isan, in northeast Thailand. But also, all the Thais admit that probably the best monks come out of the northeast part of Thailand. <laughs> so, like Ajahn Man and Ajahn all these, these great Ajahns from the forest tradition, almost all of them were from 
uh, northeast Thailand, many of them from Ubon, the province that I lived in with Ajahn Chah. And I remember when I was, uh, before I became a monk, I was teaching English in Bangkok. And uh, I, I was teaching at the Thammasat University in the mornings, and then the evenings I'd go to this English school uh, near to the Grand Palace in that part of that kind of the Nam Luang area of Bangkok. And there, uh, I remember meeting, uh, at this time there was a, the 1966, so there was a lot of uh, American Air Force bases in Thailand at the time. The Vietnam thing was beginning to escalate. And so one of the uh, teachers at this language school was uh, an American airman. And he came back after an absence of a week or so. So I asked him where he'd been, and he said, well, I've been to this place in Northeast Thailand, he says, so poor. The people are so poor that they they don't have enough food to eat, they have to eat insects. So I thought, oh, I, I'm never going to go there. I hope I never have to go to that place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just warning you not to make statements. Uh, Because I imagine myself as a monk kind of living on the beaches like at Gaw Samoy, or, you know, kind of <laughs> palm trees and sand and sitting on the, in caves and kind of beautiful mountains and kind of sitting there in samadhi and realizing the truth <laughs> and uh, in a kind of romantic vision. And I ended up in this place, Ubon Rajatani, for 10 years. And it's true, they eat insects. <laughs> <laughs> so, this was, uh, this was not my choice, but uh, when I, I remember when I went there, uh, I was, uh, the first year that I was a monk, I was a novice. And I ordained up in Nongkai, which is uh, the province in the north, uh, northeast part of Thailand where you cross the Mekong to go into Laos. And so the first year I spent in this, in this place where uh, I just meditated. I lived in a little hut for a, a year, lived alone in a monastery but, and didn't really uh, associate with anybody, just practiced meditation. And during that year I had a, a lot of insight into what I needed. One thing I knew I needed was a teacher because I could see that I, I had a lot of arrogance and uh, a kind of character that needed, I needed limits on my behavior. And I needed to learn how to obey somebody, how to, how to serve somebody else. Uh, I'd always been a kind of independent person and and uh, thought of myself in, in that way. And uh, I could see that uh, one thing I really needed to learn was how to uh, obey somebody, uh, somebody above me, and, uh, and learn how to serve and help uh, in a community. So as I had these insights, uh, I didn't know where to go because the monastery I was living at was, was uh, I could, I mean, I could pretty write my own uh, agenda there. Big, tall American and uh, a bit in awe, you know, I could just kind of puff out my chest and look fierce and couldn't get anything I wanted almost. So, <laughs> so I uh, decided <laughs> I need to find a teacher that I wouldn't fall for that. <laughs> I didn't know where to go. So I, and during this time when I made this wish, then this monk arrives, uh, just by chance, by coincidence, um, a monk from Ajahn Chah's monastery, uh, who happens to speak English, and no other monks in Ajahn Mo Chah's monastery could speak English, but this one could speak English. And uh, he came and stayed at the monastery I was living in. And so he took me to 
ติอาจารย์ชา And there, uh, I spent about ten years uh, because finding a good teacher like that, I thought better better stick around as long as I can. Because uh, you don't find ajans of that caliber; they are growing on trees. So I thought, might as well make the most of it. As, as long as he'll have me, I'll I'll uh, stay around. And so, living that life uh, in the Thai forest tradition was uh, was something that I particularly wanted to learn how to do. And uh, it was a, a life that uh, I, I liked the ideal of it. I liked the idea of of of, of that kind of monasticism. I found it very inspiring as an ideal. But the realities of it were something else, and uh, it it was after the kind of uh, romance, romantic honeymoon ended. And the, you know, first I was entranced and inspired, and and uh, uh, felt uplifted by the life. And then that, when that disappeared, then I was began my, the old critical mind started operating and. And uh, the weather got hot, and the and all the bugs and the mosquitoes, and I began to hate the place. And uh, and then the rainy season, when it rained, and in the monsoon season, it everything begins to smell bad. Everything kind of turns rotten and stinky. And I remember sitting there sometimes thinking, why am I here? You know. I don't have to be here. <laughs> the food sometimes could be. Uh, in those days, Ajahn Chah loved uh, what they call toramon, which is kind of testing our patient endurance uh, to the point where we didn't think we we would be able to endure another moment. And so this was this was kind of a koan for me, and I, I'd hear myself saying, "I can't take any more of this. I've had enough." This is the end, <laughs> and then I found out I could endure more. <laughs> I began to notice that there is one part of me that was screaming away, saying, "I can't take any more. I've had enough. I'm fed up, totally fed up with this place." And I found out I actually could take more of it, and so I began to distrust this inner kind of uh, hysterical screaming thing in me. Uh, that was always saying, you know, "I'm fed up. I can't take it." When you're living a life that is uh, is contained and and is very very uh, kind of restrained, the life it's a very restrained kind of life. Coming from from a life in California where where I lived, I was anything but restrained. In Berkeley, you know where. You, The thing I did being restrained was was a was a perversion in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so, then trying to develop restraint in this monastery, well, it was you know it did, the atmosphere didn't help in the sense of the 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 monastic form and the uh, the the presence and the Conditions helped uh, a lot towards restraint, but there's also uh, a, a lot of habits patterns that were just resisting it. I found just being held down, being con- uh, being limited all the time, but feeling this incredible frustration, feeling like I'm being suffocated by the system, and of course, being an American, you. You have this. Uh, you, you don't. You, we're, we're egalitarians. We're brought up with this egalitarian ideal of freedom and equality. So, so then you're living in a hierarchical structure of the kind of based on seniority. Uh, so this was this is quite a drastic change to to learn to live within a hierarchy rather than a, a sense of everybody's the same. Uh, learning to obey, learning to 
have duties that you perform. If, uh, because I was the most junior monk there, and then there were certain duties that I had to perform towards the ones who were senior to me. Uh, and learning to to acknowledge and to to take an interest in performing these duties was quite a challenge. Uh, because there was also, you know, I found out a, a, a real selfishness in me that that wanted to to live monastic life pretty much on my own terms and wanted to you know I was quite willing to do perform duties if it was convenient for me <laughs> but, but some many much of the time it wasn't convenient <laughs> and so I felt this kind of resistance and and uh, rebelliousness but these are emotions that come up and these are the things that you're looking at in your meditation, at least I was at that time. I became aware of, of, uh, of just this uh, kind of stubbornness and, and a kind of uh, immaturity that, that uh, just grumbled and complained if, I didn't, if things didn't suit me. So there are many instances that I've talked about in tapes and other talks and in the books uh, that uh, my books but the during the the first year there there was a lot of uh, I felt a lot of resistance and a lot of rebelliousness uh, became very critical but all the time the the emphasis was on this mindfulness of what you're feeling so this was quite an interesting uh, time for me because I wasn't just, uh, you know, kind of browbeaten into conformity through, uh, through kind of spanking me if I was naughty or punishing me. It wasn't like a military camp. Uh, but there was this, uh, this continuous kind of encouragement to really acknowledge what I was feeling. And, this, uh, and the whole agreement, if one was to live in a monastery, which I chose, it wasn't a monastery, nobody pushed me into this place, I chose to live there, then the agreement was to conform to its discipline, to surrender to the form of the Wat Pa Pong monastic life. So I was quite free to leave at any time. There is no kind of contract, you know, that I had to stay there or anything. But in Thailand, they're quite liberal about things like monks disrobing. You don't ordain for life and you... And if you can't take the life, you can leave without any great disgrace or any great problems. During the time of changing from from adapting myself to a new culture, which I was living with that, in a place where nobody could speak English, where I had to learn their language and they spoke a dialect, a Northeast dialect. They, they didn't speak the kind of lingua franca, the Bangkok Thai. So I had to learn two languages at the same time. They had to learn the Bangkok Thai and the Northeast Thai. And that was frustrating just because nobody could speak English. I had to you know, kind of be the stupid one for at least a year, not usually not knowing what in the heck anyone was saying. And uh, then um, the uh, learning to, to adapt myself to a, a very strict and conservative monastic lifestyle, learning to eat food that I didn't particularly like at first. And in, in those days, Ajahn Chah loved to have, when the food would come to the monastery, people would bring food uh, and they'd make food in the monastery. But uh, Ajahn Chah had this custom that would, when they'd bring the food, then he'd mix all the food up in one big bowl. So the, the villagers would bring nice little curries with chicken and another little curry with fish and another little curry with with frog (laughs) (laughs) 
And then Ajahn Chah would dump them all in a bowl like this, uh, and uh, in a big, big basin. And all this stuff would go into one thing, and then you mix it up. And it, it was a horrible thing. <laughs> you know. it had, and they, and then the uh, the custom there was to eat a lot of uh, the nuns in the monastery would would glean things from the forest around. So you'd get a lot of leaves, of tree leaves, and things like this to eat. <laughs> and uh, I remember writing my mother saying, "I'm living on tree leaves." <laughs> she she wrote back a letter of great concern. <laughs> <laughs> And then, then we, we had ate from an alms bowl. So we had, after the Ajahn Chah managed to ruin the, all his food, <laughs> then then they'd pass it out and they'd put it in the alms bowl. You get you have your they eat this sticky rice, this glutinous rice in Northeast Thailand. You have a, a bowl of this glutinous rice, and then they put in these the, these things that these these things that they called food, <laughs> and. And you said they're supposed to just accept, you know. And um, at first I couldn't eat the food. It was just so, it just made me sick to even look at it. So, but it was, it was during the, the um, mango season. And Wat Pa Pong had, was a, had a mango orchard. So there were, this was a kind of season where there were the, the mango trees were and produced an enormous amount of mangoes, and there were big trays of mangoes going by. So I managed to eat, live on mangoes for the first month. Mangoes and sticky rice, which is very good, by the way. <laughs> Recommend it. Mangoes and sticky rice. <laughs> but then, after a month, uh, the mango season ended, and, uh, and then I kept getting thinner and thinner. And finally, I started learning how to eat the food. And uh, surprising enough, how how adapt how uh, how well we can adapt. I learned to to. Uh, I thought I began to think if I could learn to eat this food, I could live anywhere on this planet, <laughs> because the food couldn't possibly be any worse than this. <laughs> so, so just with that motivation in mind, and and the idea that a monk is supposed to eat food as medicine, not as not for delight, not for fun, not for pleasure, not for beautification. So, the, and Ajahn Chah was making sure that we weren't eating for pleasure. <laughs> but this was because we had we we had to eat this food mindfully, and and uh, so a lot of practice around eating the food. You eat with your fingers, and then you, and then uh, cleaning the alms bowl and taking care of, your, your life is built around taking care of your requisites like your robes and your alms bowl, very simple things that, that you have, you give a significant importance to so that you're, you, you're, you're really using those as objects for, say, mindful attention, taking care of them and not just uh, using them heedlessly. The, the food was uh, sometimes um, in the nearby town on a, on a festival day. The, one of the customs was to uh, uh, send in a, a kind of coach or a big lorry or truck and take the monks in. We all get into this, this lorry sometimes, back of a, of a truck. And one time Ajahn Chah said, you look like a bunch of pigs being taken to the marketplace. <laughs> And they drive us into this, into the into the local, into the town, and we'd go on an alms round with Ajahn Chah. And this, was, this was kind of a, a grand experience because the whole town it would turn out and line the the main street, and it, we could walk for two miles sometimes up this this main street of this town, and uh, people would be give, putting things in the alms bowl. They had all kinds of nice things ready and um, would offer them into the alms bowl. Your alms bowl would get filled up, and then a man would come around with a big basket, and you'd pour it out into the basket and, and go on. And you'd have to do this so many times. 
But at this time, one of the things was that when you got back to the monastery, you could choose what you wanted to eat from this, what was in your alms bowl. So this was such a rare occasion, because usually you got this food all mixed up together, that it, it made you go really crazy in your mind. <laughs> so you, I would, you know, I remember people putting, like some woman would put some nice little cake or something in my alms bowl, and and I try to, I try to dump out all the rest of the food and hold on to this cake without. <laughs> I didn't want the man who was holding the basket to know what I was doing. So, so and all the kind of deviousness and kind of greed would would rise to the surface, and uh, just the anxiety, you know, just the effort that I would put in to try to see, see something and just hold on and try to keep it and. So when I got back, I could I could enjoy the, this particular thing that I was obsessed with. Another thing was that I found uh, I was talking to Jack Cornfield this evening about the the kind of obsession you have with sweets when you're a monk there. Because he was he was with me for a while and it was at Wat Pa Pong and and he also had the same problems around <laughs> the same. <laughs> The same problems around food, and and uh, you, you know, here I was a, a thirty, I was thirty-three years old, and uh, at the time, and I thought, uh, you know, sweets and that had never been much of a problem for me since I was a child. But then, as soon as I entered monastic life, I found myself just obsessed with uh, with uh, with sweets, and I. Uh, whether it was the, the diet we had or, or one thing, you see, that in the monastic life, you're a celibate, you live a celibate life, so any kind of uh, sexual activity is forbidden. Uh, so, so that limits, say, the pleasure uh, that you can have. Uh, you're, you're living, uh, you're living uh, you know, you're, you're, you can only eat one meal a day. And, and oftentimes that's just something, you know, without any, any kind of really uh, kind of delicious food. Uh, but you are allowed, as medicine, uh, sugar in the, uh, sugar and honey in the afternoon if it's offered. So I remember one time Ajahn Chah gave me a bag of sugar uh, in the afternoon. And I was so happy to get this sugar that I went back to my kuti and I thought, uh, I think I'll just take a little taste of this. So I opened the bag, took a little bit of sugar on, on, a, on a teaspoon, put it in my mouth, and within 15 minutes I consumed the whole bag of sugar. It's like I couldn't stop myself. Just one, one little taste, and suddenly it just led into this kind of total, uh, ob- total kind of movement towards eating the whole bag without being able to stop till it till it was all gone. Where did that come from? Because I'd never acted like that before. Remember having dreams. Like dreams, sometimes I dream about sweets. I'd be going, w- I'd go to sleep. I'd have a dream. I was going in a pastry shop, <laughs> and I'd sit down at the table and I'd order these delicious-looking pastries. And I'd sit there, and, I, and just as I was about to eat one, I'd wake up. <laughs> I, I kept thinking, if only I could stay asleep sleep long enough to at least enjoy eating one of these pastries. <laughs> Well, the mind, mind plays a lot of <laughs> tricks uh, uh, in the, when you're, when you're, when you're saying, when you're living uh, this life where you can't just fulfill your wishes and do what you want, but you're, you're learning to operate within a structure and within the limitations. And, and so because of that, uh, a lot of strange things happen. Strange feelings, kind of incredible uh, forms of obsessive greed and and that would arise over things that, say, before had never really been that much uh, 
really noticed as being a, a problem. Then I realized that when I was a layman, my greed was spread over a wide range of things. You know, so there was a, it was kind of scattered over many other things. But in monastic life, it was all focused on sugar and sweets. Because that was the one pleasurable thing allowed, the one sense pleasure that you could indulge in was sugar. So that was an interesting one to just see how, and because of that, because it, that greed was connected on such a ridiculous thing as sugar, that, uh, that I, that you could contemplate it. Now I began to contemplate this, this state, this, this, this obsessive concern and greed where I'd even dream about it. Where it would take over my... Here I was ordaining, ordained as a monk to lead a spiritual life, you know, very high. But here I was acting like, you know, like a, like a hungry ghost. You know, just uh, thinking, dreaming uh, about one thing. It wasn't sex, it was sugar. One monk, even uh, uh, an American monk that lived with us for a while, <laughs> have his mother, he's from a well, wealthy family, have his mother send big boxes uh, of sweets, chocolate cakes and things like that to him. <laughs> <laughs> The time I sometimes would look the utter disgust at it at the for the Western monks because we were so kind of we must have looked so ridiculous and so silly in their in their perspective because they they're from a they're from that society and their whole kind of culturally attuned to it where we were we were not we were still you know operating from the momentum of a whole cultural conditioning that was from a very different uh, kind of place. Now, in learning to to reflect on these these desires, these these obsessions of the mind, is very important. That's where we need like precepts and things that that stop us just from following the, what we're used to, what, what is the easiest thing to do, what our habit is. Uh, so, like precept, the eight precepts that you took in the beginning is like a, a standard that, that's there to kind of remind you that you can't just follow, you can't just, just uh, operate according to the way you would if you weren't on the eight precepts. And that, that helps us to be and to look at this, this, this movement, this, this way we, when we get this impulse and how we follow it and, and the result of following that impulse. Or not being able to f- follow the impulse because of the precept, the sense of frustration <coughs> or the way one can justify breaking the precept. And it, with your rational mind, you can justify any anything you want to justify, in fact. I can. I've got a mind that can justify anything I want to do. Uh, though I don't believe that either, that my rational mind, because it, 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 can, it can go around all kinds and make justify almost anything uh, that I feel like I want, would like to do. But the... This restraint and restriction does give a, give you this sense of stopping. You can't you can't just follow that and contemplate this this state of mind, this desire, this this momentum, this impulse, and and with this expanded awareness, this kind of reflective awareness, this intuitive awareness, you begin to to notice how how strong these these impulses and these uh, compulsions can be, until you begin to to really look at them as mental objects rather than as some, uh, something that you've got to 
fulfill. Because even though the mind does scream sometimes, saying, I can't take any more of this, the truth of the matter is that we can take more. That, that, that what we can endure is amazing. That the human being has amazing powers of endurance. And if you learn to endure and not just be caught in the momentum of impulsivity, uh, then you begin to uh, find a kind of strength in your practice that you don't have if you're just a slave to habits and impulses. The training, say, of monastic life was, was based on this restraint. And I remember uh, one, of, one of the things that many of the monastic rules used to really irritate me because they just seemed to have, they seemed to be pointless or lacking in common sense. And one of them was, that I used to really detest in the beginning, was the fact that, uh, now, Thailand is a very hot country. And in the, and you, you're given these three robes when you're ordained. You're given this this robe, it's called the Sangati, that's over the shoulder, and this robe, which is called the Chivara. And then there's a loincloth underneath this. So you're given three robes when you become a monk or become a bhikkhu. And so, the custom in the Thai first tradition is that when you go out early in the morning on alms round, you have to wear all three robes. So. So I mean, you, so you have to wear this this robe. This is a double robe. It has two layers to it. You have to wear this and this robe together. You have to put it on, and there's a certain way of putting it on right and rolling it and getting it all together. And, and at first, it, when when you first ordain uh, a newly ordained monk, is always an obvious kind of farcical-looking creature <laughs> because their robes are never look right and they're falling off and. They're all over the place. And, so, and, and Western monks are probably the worst ones for looking ridiculous. <laughs> so so, uh, so I remember when, when I found out that they expected me to wear <clears throat> in these hot mornings, because even the mornings were hot, they had to wear this robe and this robe, put all this stuff, stuff on, and then go out and, and, uh, and you had to walk. If you were young, you had to usually walk quite long distances, barefoot, through paddy fields and all kinds of places, into villages, collecting alms and coming back. By the time you got back, all your robes were soaking wet with, with sweat. And, and the, the robes were also, uh, they, were dyed, they were dyed robes with natural dyes, this, this jackfruit dye. So, after a while, this sweat, if you don't air your robes enough, and the, with, mixed with the jackfruit dye, begins to smell really <coughs> terrible. And then when the rains start and all that, <laughs> the, the, you, you're living a life basically uh, using the robes and taking care of them and washing them and sewing them, and, and life is around robes. And I didn't want to live around robes. I wanted to meditate. <laughs> I didn't want to spend that much time. So, I found this incredibly frustrating, and I remember putting on my robes one day, and, and uh, the, in the morning, and the, this, and I, and I was talking to to one of the monks that was with me, and I said, "This is a stupid custom. This is really stupid wearing these robes. All you need is this this robe. You know, this thin robe would be good enough. It covers you adequately. I'm just being very reasonable." And it, it's modest, and it's enough, and, and it's very difficult to make these double robes, these sangatis, takes a lot of cloth, and if you keep wearing it uh, every day out in, in the heat, and that pretty soon it starts deteriorating, and then you have to make another one, and you have to find more material, it takes a lot of time, dyeing the, and the, sewing it and dyeing it, and, and I, I've made a very good case for not wearing it. <laughs> Very re reasonable man that I am, and uh, I was really whinging and complaining. So then the monk goes and tells Ajahn Chah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
So then, then I was called in front of Ajahn Shah, and and I felt so embarrassed. And suddenly, suddenly it dawned on me that why make a case? Why make a problem about this? Just do it. If this is what they do. Then you do this. This is it's not worth making a scene about. Uh, you know, it's bearable. I can bear it. I can I can sweat through all three robes, and I can still survive. And I can. It isn't going to ruin my life, but what's ruining my life is my whinging mind. You know, I don't want to do this. This is stupid. I can't see any point. So I began to see. Lung Po Chan was very good at getting me to see what was real suffering and what wasn't. Was sweating through your robes and having put on on all the robes in a hot, in, in the heat of, and uh, and sweat through the robes and walk distances barefoot and come back and eat. Horrible food. Was this suffering? (laughs) (laughs) And at first I thought, yes, it is. It is. A lot of suffering. And then on further reflection I began to realize that it was that this I could bear. This is bearable suffering. This stuff is completely endurable. But the suffering that is unendurable was my complaining, my whinging, my my grumpiness. This kind of this thing that eats you up from inside, that just that whinges about life and blames and has strong views and doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to do it, wants to gets fed up, wants to leave, and wants to, doesn't want to cooperate, and just gripes about life. That's the suffering that you can't bear. I couldn't bear that. I couldn't bear to live monastic life if I was just going to complain about it. So I saw that very clearly, that uh, that monastic life was, in. I could endure monastic life, and what Ajahn Chah expected his monks to do, I could do that. I could, that was all right. Once I committed myself to that way, I had no problem with it. It was, it wasn't suffering. I could, I learned to eat the food and uh, put on the robes and take care of the robes and do all the necessary things. And, And that was, that I began to actually enjoy. Where at first I found it, uh, because of the way I looked at it, uh, you know, unbearable. So I began to see, I can, there's a lot of things I think I can't bear that I can, that, that I'm not limited by this, this weak, whingy thing inside that says, I can't take any more, I've had enough. That, that uh, there's something stronger than, than that, that I must trust and not be uh, dominated by this other thing. Because I see in so much of my life before that, that kind of force was, was even in the midst of a comfortable lifestyle, was always creating suffering, even when the food was good, or life was comfortable and easy, and I could do what I felt like doing and get what I wanted. That, that, that habit of complaining, of, of being critical, of being of uh, whinging about life, of, of just, uh, you know, endlessly uh, looking at life through, a, through the critical eye, that that was the suffering that I couldn't bear. So living in a forest monastery also, when you look at, at uh, I'm from, a, from the state, I'm from the city, I'm, I was born and grew up in Seattle, in a middle class, family. So we always had comfortable things around us. I was born, you know, in a nice house with electricity and running water and uh, my mother was very uh, interested in providing us with good food and uh, we had uh, all the comforts that were part of a whole cultural expectation, isn't it? Life uh, was always we were expecting that life was 
supposed to be easy and comfortable. E- electricity was was what was natural to my life. I grew up with, uh, you know, I didn't have to light candles or use paraffin lamps or anything like that. Uh, you just switch on the light. That's all. Uh, you could go to the sink and you have, like here, you know, hot and cold running water <laughs> at your service. And, and uh, if, you know, you, you lived in a house where it didn't, if there were any insects or rats or anything, you got rid of them. You killed them. So I remember, you know, when any ants would enter my house, I'd just spray it with this kind of insecticide and and uh, get make sure that they didn't know n- nothing would ever get in that crawled. And uh, but then in <coughs> in Thai Forest Monastery, you're living under this precept of non-violence, not killing anything. And and then Thailand has a billion more insects than than the United States or Seattle, Washington. So, you know, here I was learning to share my life. One, I remember one time going back after evening puja to my kuti. And this is at Wananachat, and I, they built me a bamboo kuti, which was quite nice. I went back and I had my flashlight. And I, shine the flashlight inside and it was, it was completely covered in termites. There was a migration of termites that had come and taken over my whole cootie. Everywhere I looked there were termites. This brought on a state of righteous indignation. <laughs> you know, I, didn't, I didn't understand termites. I felt so invaded and so, you know, like these termites had taken over my space. And all I want to do is just get rid of them. So I started sweeping them out. But termites, in time, they have very soft bodies. So I thought I was killing these termites just by sweeping them. They, they don't have much protection. The tiny little things like ants and then they have very soft little succulent bodies. So you, uh, just by sweeping them, you're killing them. So I thought, oh, well, I'm so tired now. So I went found a place to sleep somewhere else. The next day I woke up and I thought, well, I've got to wonder what those termites have done. They probably have eaten the whole cootie by now. <laughs> so when I went back, they were all gone. Every one of them had gone, you know, and the cootie, cootie was still there, <laughs> unharmed. When they eaten much of it, I don't know. It, it was still standing, <laughs> and the, and then I realized that they were just passing through. Maybe they were showing respect. Maybe they come to say hello, tomato. You know. <laughs> Maybe I was taking it all the wrong way, and then, and then uh, I didn't understand the nature of termites. But they were, when when a termite migration takes place. They, they, don't, they don't kind of detour around a place. They just go through it. And that's what they did. <laughs> they were just passing through, impermanent. And here I'd been so upset, you know, in a state of outrage the night before. Well, these are the things you contemplate, you know, in terms of re- reflecting on experience, on the states of mind that, that arise, how you... Uh, that that you, you sometimes can't help but feel like this. But now, say, we're, we're using this awakened mind rather than just being caught helplessly in the, in the impulses and habits that we have, so we can reflect on what we're feeling and learn from that. And even though you... There's a lot in life that you can't change. You can't make everything to what you want it to be. You can change your attitude towards it. And that's what so much of meditation is really really about, isn't it? Good meditation is changing your attitude from the old self-centered, uh, get rid of this and I don't want that, and, and uh, the, the annihilationist t- uh, kind of mind that we have, to this, way of welcoming life, as I was uh, 
describing yesterday, the state of this ability changing from how dare these termites come and I don't like this and I don't like that to welcoming the opportunity, the challenge of eating food that you don't like. Just think of that as a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> welcoming it, you know. More, please. And, and then uh, <laughs> putting on three robes on a hot morning and sweating it. They say, welcome. Three robes, sweat, discomfort, feeling of fed up, wanting to run away. Welcome, uh, the whole thing. Till just through this, this way of welcoming, changing the attitude from, from the, the, the one I had of complaining, can't stand it, I, uh, it shouldn't be like this, to welcoming. Uh, it gave me a whole new way of dealing with, with life as I have to live it and experience it. I find this, this, this way of welcoming life is, is like in, in the first noble truth, understanding suffering. Understanding life is like this. Life isn't meant to be what we want and what we like. Life is like this. It's all about the way it is. Some, sometimes it's very nice, sometimes it, it's horrible, sometimes, but much of the time it's neither one or the other. Just like sitting here, isn't it? Uh, if, you know, in the mind, you're just with the breath of the body, with, with the posture. There's nothing. The place is a, is a lovely spot, isn't it? Pleasing to the eye. It's, it's very well thought out. It's what a place should be, Spirit Rock. It's, it's what, you know, I could easily say, it's what a meditation center should be. But even then I can create endless suffering here if I want. <laughs> In my mind. <laughs> so that's another reflection, you see, the, 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 with the food that you get, the, the shelter that you're living with. Learning to, to, to contemplate this in terms of gratitude rather than in terms of complaining or Wanting, wanting it to be different. And this is very important, is to change the attitude towards, towards uh, say, food and shelter, uh, clothes and medicine, the, the four requisites. So learning, I found out I could eat the food that Ajahn Chah offered. And I could survive on it, and uh, I I could I could even thrive on it. Uh, I learned how to, I, and after a while I became uh, I never I never developed a great love of living directly with Ajahn Chah because the food was so bad actually. <laughs> So I did find myself going off to other monasteries, branch monasteries, <laughs> where the food was better. But, so I've never tried to carry that through in my own monastery. <laughs> Another thing was that, that we, would, um, we would get this kind of food that was all mixed up, but Ajahn Chah wouldn't have to eat it. He'd be given all the kind of nice things. He'd be sitting there just in front of him, all these nice things, and looking happy, you know. <laughs> and you think, how dare you? <laughs> and uh, but he, but he was a mirror for, for my mind, and because I could think, of the, how dare yeah, you, you, you're eating like a king, but we're eating like dogs. <laughs> then I. I could see that was the suffering in my mind. I was creating suffering. Uh, like, like a teacher like that, it like a, it was like a mirror. His, his, his mind was, for me, I could see my own uh, suffering by just looking at him. He wouldn't even have to say anything. Sometimes I'd be so, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be sitting in my kuti and I'd be 
making a problem about something or other in the monastery. I mean, I'm, like, this is terrible. I've got to ask Ajahn Chah about this. We can't allow this to happen. We've got to do something. <laughs> I'm going to tell Lung Po Cha. And I'd get up and go over to his kuti. And he, he, he was to be sitting. He, 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 the kutis were built on pillars, so he'd be sitting underneath his kuti with a kind of reception area. And as soon as I'd go in, I'd see him, and all this kind of righteous indignation and this big issue that I had going in my mind, suddenly it seemed totally insignificant. Even, even, he, didn't, he didn't need to say anything. I never asked, I never said anything to him. But just, I've always felt like he was like a, he helped during those years as, as a kind of mirror for me. As soon as I saw Lung Pa Chao, I was like looking into a mirror, seeing my own kind of ugly state of mind. <laughs> But well, once I saw what I was doing, I could, I, could, I could let it go. I couldn't always see what I was doing, but with a mirror, then I began to see, I began to reflect and observe what suffering really is. Living in the Thai Forest Monastery, because of it, it was basic, now Wat Pa Pong is quite, quite, uh, quite comfortable. And the standard of living in Thailand is, is very high now. But in those days, it was very primitive. No electricity, only wells. You had to spend every day. You had to go and draw water from the well, and and uh, you had the way you had to bathe. Everything was was very basic. But the thing I found living like that was that it was all right. That 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 living in that very basic way was was quite easy for me. It wasn't suffering, and uh, and that pleased me because being brought up in the kind of middle class waspy background that I'm from, you you think that you don't have this, you don't have that, you you just can't survive. But I was so happy to know that. You don't need very much in life. You don't have to spend your life just trying to hang on to all kinds of things because you think that you can't live without them. That actually, sometimes, life in a more primitive style is, is in some ways easier than, than having a lot of wealth, having big houses and estates and cars and yachts and... Thoroughbred horses, pedigreed dogs. You know, this oh, this headache. Thinking having having a wife and a mistress. <laughs> <laughs> having several wives that you've divorced, having to pay alimony and children and and uh, big houses and and all the rest of it. You know, it gets so complicated. Even if you, even if you've got the money to support all that, your Mercedes Benz, your Rolls Royce. <laughs> but living like in the walking barefoot through the rice paddies, <laughs> that's all. That's that's all right, actually. <clears throat> Eating, learning to eat food that you're given with, uh, and eat it with gratitude, that's a lovely feeling in the mind. Rather than demanding a very high standard of cuisine that you just get fussy. You know, you get really picky and fussy if you have, if you have high standards. Because the standard, the higher they are, the more, the more delicate you become, the more enslaved you become to that standard. So I know people, wealthy people, who are so wealthy that they have they can't live without their servants in Thailand. I know people who who have they can't travel without a retinue of servants and the cook and the and everything has to be just like this and they they couldn't ride in a in anything but a Mercedes Benz and 
or no like this. So you become enslaved to to uh, to this high standard, <coughs> and and in the, in that there's uh, you know you you just you you have this dread of losing it. You're very limited in what you can do, and because you, that high standard is hard to maintain, costs a lot of money. But say the idea of the Buddhist of the bhikkhu is an alms mendicant, being someone who depends on the kindness of other people for survival, and this is very important that when. Uh, to, to, to contemplate this. Why did the Buddha establish his monastic order on alms mendicancy? And I didn't realize what, how, what this really meant till after I ordained. Suddenly I began to really understand. Now I'm an alms mendicant. I'm no longer independent person, you know. I have my own money and can do what I want and I don't need, I don't have to depend on anyone. Now I have to depend on everyone. For the basics, just for a meal. So then I question, why did the Buddha establish his monastic order on alms mendicancy? And because of that question, then I see that, that and, and Lung Pa Cha once told me that, you know, there, wherever there are good people, you will survive. When I asked whether, one time he asked me if I was would ever go back to the United States. And at that time, I, I didn't, I'd never thought of coming back here. I was very happy living in Thailand. I didn't want to come back to the United States. I'd never, never given it a thought. And so my immediate reply was, oh, I, I, I'm not going back. And he said, why? I said, because how could I live as a Buddhist monk in the United States? You know, how could I go out on an alms round and how could I expect people to... Uh, well, there are kind people there. And he said, well, then you can go back. <laughs> so that, was very, that was very important for me to hear because what he was saying, you don't have to be Buddhist to be kind, do you? That, that kindness is a part of our humanity. And, and that the function of an alms mendicant order is, is to arouse that, to, to bring that act of kindness into a kind of uh, material experience of dropping food in an alms bowl and so forth. And so I began to, and, and then I remember going to India in 1974 just to test it out. Thailand was easy, but not India. So I lived for five months uh, as an alms mendicant in India, just going around begging for food. <laughs> I was, found myself in Benares, uh, <coughs> on the ghats in Benares, uh, with all the other beggars. <laughs> this, this, is, this is quite quite a come down, you know. And at that time, as we were at the God's where all the beggars get free food, and uh, and a big air-conditioned coach came, and and it stopped, and out of this coach came all these uh, German uh, tourists, and they were all fat, <laughs> every one of them, and it was the days of the miniskirt. And these these women were all very fat with and these tiny little miniskirts, <laughs> and then they all were cameras, and they all had these kind of uh, uh, drip-dry kind of clothes on that you, they wear in tropics, and they all started taking pictures of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, here is this whole row of, of beggars, and the beggars in India, if you've never been there, some of them, you know, they, they, they go out of their way to look miserable. <laughs> and so, there they were, or there we were, <laughs> and these, these incredibly kind of well-nourished tourists were taking pictures of us. So then I thought, where would you rather be? Would you rather be with them or with these beggars? And then I thought, I think I'd rather live with these beggars. 
<laughs> yes, I felt, I felt, you know, how, you know, that, that whole thing of, of just opulence and indulgence. And I didn't, I didn't want to, that kind of a life. And I did appreciate just the, the fact that, that even uh, this alms mendicancy is, is uh, in many ways it's very humbling because the, and you brought up the idea of, of not begging. As a, begging is a disgraceful thing, but it's not a begging that we're doing, but a, a giving opportunity. Because like in, in living in, in England for 23 years now, England's not a Buddhist country. But yet, my life in that country has brought forth the kindest people. Like my life there is, is the people I meet are incredibly kind, and uh, the you know the, the and, and the uh, food, the requisites, the things that one needs are abundant in a non-Buddhist country. So that says a lot, doesn't it? It's pointing to the human the human potential for kindness. That kindness is something that, that's natural to us and that we love. We love the opportunity where, where we can give something, help somebody, uh, without expecting some reward for it, and not making a deal, not buying something. Where, where the sense of dawn of giving and generosity is, is just the joy of it in itself without asking even a thank you or any kind of acknowledgement because uh, generosity and kindness are give our lives a quality a beauty uh, that that is part of our humanity so then i can see that the buddha actually established the the monastic order because when you think this this order you can trace back its lineage back to the lord buddha in india 2542 years ago what, what institutions and conventions can you think of that are that old, that still exist, that still work? Well, that says a lot, doesn't it? Just the fact that Buddhist monasticism has managed to survive through the rise and fall of so many kingdoms and empires in the past 2,500 years. And it's still, you know, still... An, an active, uh, flourishing institution still works, still is useful. So then we begin to appreciate the, the, the way, say, tradition does allow, why the Buddha established the, a tradition and a, and a vinaya, a discipline, and a, and a way of life, because obviously he knew this would, would give it the momentum and the ability to to go from one generation to the next. And so now we have the, the, this, this kind of Buddhist uh, monasticism is, is not just uh, uh, concentrated in Asian countries anymore. It's, it's, uh, there's an interest in Buddhist meditation, in Buddhist uh, teaching, Buddhist monasticism is moving into uh, every part of the planet now. People from in, in England, we get people from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from places that before you would think people wouldn't have known anything about Buddhism. So, in terms of the, your own precepts, I hear from the kitchen that the refrigerator is chuck a block with food that people have brought when they were not supposed to bring any food. Uh, and so we were wondering if this food could be donated to the homeless. Because uh, we don't, you don't need it. <laughs> so this is just a suggestion. An act from the heart of giving to the homeless. You know, I'm not asking for it for myself. <laughs> then, uh, then also to see that that this uh, precept around food, the Vikala Pojana, is, is to really try to live within that limitation, such as the 
They're, to not take solid foods in the uh, afternoon unless there is some kind of special permission uh, or, or, or critical need. But what's more important really is to, to look at that, to observe the, the kind of mental states that arise about around the, the obsessions we have around diet, food, and nourishment. Because uh, that we become enslaved by all that and, uh, and limited by that until we begin to see through it, see the suffering we create and the anxiety and the and the impulsivity and the obsessions that we have about I can't stand, I can't bear, I can't take it. I have to have this kind of inner thing that 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 screams away. <coughs> and then from my own experience, uh, I don't believe that, that inner voice. It just goes on and on. And it screams, and it yells and says, you can't take it, but you can. So you find, you know, you begin to feel more kind of a sense of strength and self-respect growing from, from this awareness. And, and the aim is this unshakableness, this sense of the mind that is so still, so centered, so, so pure, that, that all the forces of Mara cannot shake it. And that's possible. I don't think that you can't do it. This is, this, it's your, your true nature. And, and it's in this, through this meditation that you begin to awaken to the true nature, to the Dhamma. So I offer this as a reflection. <coughs>